One of the questions I get asked most often is, how do I get started running servers at home? Well, if you have an old gaming PC, you may have everything you need already. Today's video is brought to you by Patriot Viper and the V380 gaming headset. Here, we find the gamer in their natural habitat. Though they may seem docile at first glance, the vibrant RGB lighting of the Viper V380 headset warns any observers to keep their distance. Camping the dark corners of the map, the gamer lies in wait. His sense of hearing heightened by the 7.1 surround sound, he's able to quickly locate any potential threats or prey. With the V380's noise-canceling microphone, their cries for aid will never be drowned out by the crunching of late-night onion-flavored snack rings. With their nightly frags secured, the gamer can now rest easy, for tomorrow brings another raid. But the gamer does not worry. With the aid of their companions, and a lair full of Viper gaming peripherals, like the V765 mechanical keyboard and the V551 gaming mouse, tomorrow's frags are nothing more than a click away. Check out the full lineup of gear from Patriot Viper by following the link down in the video description. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Getting started running your own home servers doesn't require thousands of dollars of hardware or a 42U rack out in your garage. Instead, you could just repurpose an old PC and run pretty much all the same services that I do here in my house. Right around four years ago, I posted my very first tutorial on how to install FreeNAS. But do you remember the hardware that I used to install FreeNAS? It was an Intel Xeon X3350 with 8GB of DDR2 and four 2TB HP Enterprise SAS drives. Probably the funniest thing about that setup was the RAID card that I was using. It actually was a RAID card, meaning that I couldn't use ZFS inside of FreeNAS. But I did the tutorial anyway, and I ran that server for well over a year. In 2018, I used a Xeon that was 10 years old at that time to run my home server. Along that same line of thinking, I figured the best way to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the launch of Ryzen is to use a Ryzen 1700 in a very similar build. So here we have a Gigabyte X370 motherboard and a Ryzen 7 1700 8 core 16 thread CPU. Paired to that, I'm going to throw in 32 gigabytes of Corsair DDR4 3200 megahertz memory, although this being first generation Ryzen, we likely won't be able to hit 3200 megahertz. I've also got a 256 gigabyte no name NVMe drive that I picked up on AliExpress about two years ago. Now that we have the base hardware figured out, everything else that you need to add to the server is just in support of the services that you want to run. For example, if you want to run a file server, you're obviously going to need some storage. In this case, I'm using two of these Arsenal 12 terabyte SATA drives that I picked up on Amazon. These are only about $200 each, and running in a RAID 1, we'll only get 12 terabytes of storage, but we will have some redundancy in the system. Even though, RAID is not a backup. But of course, if this is your first and only server build, you're going to want to run more than just a storage server. So in this build, I'm going to throw in a GTX 1070 Ti to run as both a Plex encoder as well as a remote gaming system. Now obviously, having a server rack out in my garage is pretty cool, and as such, I'm going to build this server inside of a 2U chassis, in this case the iStar D200. But you don't necessarily have to use a server chassis, as we are just using off-the-shelf consumer parts. If you have an old tower laying around, you could absolutely use that as well. For the power supply, I'm actually using an SFX power supply in the Inwin CS700. Reason being is there's not a lot of breathing room inside the 2U chassis, and this gives me a little bit of a gap between the top of the chassis and the power supply itself, letting the fan actually move some air. Now, for the question of the day, what are we actually going to be running on this server? Well, if this is your first time building a server, operating systems like Unraid, Proxmox, or even TrueNAS may be a little bit more of a learning curve than you're wanting. So I'm going to be installing Windows 10 LTSC, which will give us the ability to run virtual machines and even do some light gaming, as well as run pretty much any service that I want. So I don't think there's anything left to do, but uh, get this thing together and get Windows installed. Let's get to it.
and check it out. You are looking at what could be your first home server. Aside from taking twice as long as a typical PC build, this system came together with minimal trouble. The hardest part was routing cables around the chassis, as 2U boxes have surprisingly little room inside of them. The motherboard had to go in and out multiple times to lay cables underneath it, like the EPS connector that stretches from one corner of the case to the other. Overall, the layout of the iStar D200 chassis is pretty good. Room enough for two hard drives, a full ATX motherboard, three full-height PCI slots, plus five and a quarter and three and a half inch bays up front. Opening the box, it is pretty easy to tell this server is from a bygone age, as there is no ventilation in the top cover for the power supply, and included inside was a three-slot PCI riser. And yes, I said PCI riser, not PCI Express. Being built in 2009, this case was likely destined for something like a 5400 series Xeon, not a Ryzen 7 1700 and a 1070 Ti. But in the end, everything did manage to fit without much issue. Like I mentioned in the first half of this video, I'm intending for a build like this to be your first home server, made from mostly used gaming parts. It's now running Windows 10 Enterprise LTSC 2021, which you can buy a license for on various corners of the interwebs. I chose this because it's still Windows 10, meaning that it's much easier to use and troubleshoot than most Linux-based hypervisors, especially if you're a beginner. Running Windows also lets you use this system as another PC in your house, while still running virtual machines and other services on it, meaning it doesn't have to be just tucked away in a closet somewhere. Storage is incredibly straightforward on this system, as I'm just using Windows built-in software RAID controller from disk management. Running in mirrored mode does give you some redundancy to the server should one of the disks fail. But remember, RAID is not a backup. Make sure if you start storing tons of data on these drives, you don't forget to back all of it up as well. As you're most likely going to have other PCs on your network, setting this up as a file server is highly recommended. Luckily, there's a dead simple way of creating shares inside Windows. After I created the RAID storage volume, I'm simply going to create a new folder on it named Share. Right-click on the Share folder, go down to Properties, and navigate to the Sharing tab. At the top of the window, it should display the sharing status. In this case, the folder is not shared. Click on the Share button. No, 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 the other Share button. In the new window that pops up, give the share a name, and select the users you'd like to give access to. In this case, users are created locally on the Windows machine. So if you'd like to divvy out permissions to different people, you'll need to create a user on the Windows PC, and then assign permissions in this configuration window. And that's pretty much it. This will create an SMB share, which nearly every operating system has the ability to connect to. This is a great way to store backups of other PCs or centralize files you need to use on multiple devices. For running virtual machines, I'm using the built-in Windows Hyper-V, which installs in just a couple clicks. Note that you do need Windows 10 or 11 in either professional, enterprise, or education editions to make this work, as it will not install on home editions. While Hyper-V is designed to run Windows in virtual machines, it does just fine with Linux-based clients as well. I've covered most of the Hyper-V install and setup process in a previous video, where I set up GPU para-virtualization, allowing you to share a single graphics card between the host and virtual machines. This only works with Windows guests, so no GPU acceleration for Linux VMs, but it is a totally viable option for running between two and four gaming VMs off of a single GPU. Check out the link in the video description for that tutorial if it's something you want to run as well. Other services I have running include Pi-hole, as well as an outgoing VPN server. Both of these are running inside Ubuntu server VMs. With dynamic memory enabled in Hyper-V, you'll notice that these VMs are using just over one gigabyte of memory each, leaving plenty for Windows and playing games without impacting VM performance. Now, not all of your home services need to run inside VMs either. A common service most people want to run at home is Plex, which you could go through the process of setting up a virtual machine and partitioning your GPU to enable hardware encoding. But that leaves you needing more memory, needing to share your Plex library from your hard drives into the VM, and lowers the available memory to your GPU. In this case, it makes much more sense just to run Plex on the Windows host itself. Instead of needing 4 gigabytes of memory for a full Windows VM and at least 1 gigabyte of your GPU partitioned off, Plex requires only a couple hundred megabytes when running on the host and doesn't need any GPU memory at all. Nor should you lose any performance when playing games, as Nvidia's NVE and C encoder doesn't utilize any of the GPU's main cores. Instead, NVENC has its own dedicated hardware, leaving your GPU free to do more important things, like playing games, which this PC will still be able to do. And that's pretty much it if you're looking to get started running your own services at home with hardware you may already have. 
I have to admit, while it is a lot of fun to scour eBay for used Enterprise gear, sometimes it's just nice to run a simpler setup with more modern hardware. With a CPU like the Ryzen 7 1700, I've got 8 cores and 16 threads worth of power to spread around. That's a lot of additional compute power that could be put to work running services like Pi-hole, Plex, or an outgoing VPN to make your computing life easier and more enjoyable. Last but not least, I can already hear some of you plunking away on blue mechanical keyboards, but you could just do all of this in a Docker container. Yes, yes you can. But for a novice, a virtual machine with a GUI interface is much easier to navigate than diving into Windows Subsystem for Linux. But if you ask nicely in the comments below, I might put together a video on running that too. Links on where to get all the hardware in today's video will be down in the video description as well. On your way down to light me up in the comments, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. Head on over to craftcomputing.store to get yourself an official Craft Computing t-shirt or a pint glass and start drinking like a pro. That's going to do it for me in this one, guys. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Here for today is from Resurgence Brewing Company out of Buffalo, New York. It is the House Rules New England IPA, clocking in at 6.5%. I don't recall hazy IPAs ever being used in beer pong before, but this is not the best hazy I've ever had. On the nose, it's not awful, but it's also not very aromatic. There's not a lot of flavor there that you can pick up. It smells like pineapple that you'd buy in a prepared fruit dish from the grocery store that you were taking to a potluck. It's not really strong. It's not really the best pineapple or citrus smell, but it's not terrible. Flavor-wise, it's a little overcarbonated and it's just kind of there. <laughs> it's You can taste some of the citrus. There's not a lot there. There's no evolution of the flavor. It's a little bit of pineapple and a little bit of orange and then a little bit of acid, but not enough to cause a burn. But it's also not overly refreshing. It's just kind of a beer. I mean, if I were to play beer pong with a hazy IPA, this would probably be it, but I don't know that I would. Click on the share button. No, 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 the other share button. In the window that pops up, give the share a new name and... <laughs> I didn't intend for any of this to go this way. I'm just reading the lines on the screen, man.